Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, we're going to be doing a review of the first four chapters of Galatians. We have a little flex review period um, this morning. And so we'll be in Galatians. If you want to open your Bibles up to the book of Galatians, that's where we will uh, have our discussion this morning. Um, before we do that, though, let's pray together, and then we'll get into the class. So please, please pray with me. Our gracious God and our Father, our Lord, Father, you are our rock and our hope. Our whole lives, Father, are um, founded on you. And Lord, as we gather here together this morning, we give all praise and glory to your name because you give us hope and you give us, um, you've given us life. And Father, we know that our, um, our, our inheritance is dwelling with you in heaven and it's imperishable, undefiled. And uh, Father, we're just looking forward to um, growing more and more to be like you and growing closer and closer to you and Father, one day being with you in heaven. Thank you so much, Father, for the life we have in you. And thank you so much for your son who died for us, who left us an example to follow in, Father, but also who died at such a death that we would have hope and that we would have um, forgiveness for all the mistakes and shortcomings and sins in our lives. Father, help us to grow in our faith in him and to be uh, people who, who look to you every day. Thank you for this church, Lord, and thank you for this time we have together. We pray we'd have clear minds and humble hearts as we read your word and study it together. All these things we pray through Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so we're a little more than halfway through Galatians. And uh, so we, you know, it, maybe it's a good time just to stop and to, to kind of get a feel or get to, to field some questions or just to get a sense of, of where this, what this letter is about again and to sense where it's going and to maybe wrap our arms around some of the big questions once again and just uh, talk about the themes and the, the, the things that Paul's trying to get across with this, with this letter. So I would ask just a general question if you guys want, I would, I would love to hear your feedback. Overall, as we're four chapters in now to Galatians, um, just about to start the fourth chapter, what is this letter about? What is, what's hitting you? With, what, when this letter is hitting you, what's the, what are some of the main ideas? What's the biggest idea? What are some of the main themes that, you're, um, that you've been finding this time through? Or just what's been more impressive to you? Or what's struck you these, through these first four chapters of Galatians if, as we study them together? Yeah, so Paul's frustrated, right? The tone of this letter is definitely one of, of frustration. You can see it right from the start. But yeah, there were these people that had come in and, and like you said, like Paul said, he, they bewitched the Galatians and they were starting to follow something that wasn't the gospel. It wasn't, it was, you said a tangent. It was, it was kind of like the gospel, but it really wasn't the gospel at all. Um, that's really good. So that, that is the main point of, the, of Galatians. He's writing to them in these first three chapters. That's all we, you know, Paul's been spending a lot of time focusing on this idea. And this is a similarity he has with Romans. Romans deals a lot with this same idea that there, is, there are these teachers who would add the Jewish law to the gospel and make, try and, and make the burdens of the law fall upon Christians too. Good. What else has been... Um, has struck you so far through the letter to the Galatians. All right. Well, let's get into some of the, the sections we've gone through. I just wanted to give us a moment if you had anything you wanted to share overall that we could share it. But let's get into some of these sections uh, and look at, you know, just how some of the big breakouts of this chapter of this letter so far and kind of see what we've gone through and, and overlook it again and just um, maybe reiterate some of the things that we've already talked about. So the letter starts, you look at verses 1 through 10, and like Steve said, there, you know, Paul's tone becomes quickly, it becomes quickly apparent, right? 
I mean, look at chapter 1 and verse 6. How does Paul start when he starts really getting directly writing to these Galatians? What kind of tone does he have in, in Galatians 1 and 6, verse 6? Listen to this. I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which really is not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So what's the tone of this letter? From the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 6, this tone has... Steve said he's frust- that Paul's frustrated, but you can see this tone is it's serious, it's dire. Paul's urgent to these Christians because he sees them being pulled away to a false teaching. And so part of what, part, one of the questions I think it has to be, and maybe it's an obvious question, but as I was thinking, reviewing over this, I thought this is a question I hadn't really asked myself um, that someone might ask, maybe we wouldn't ask, but someone might ask of Paul, what's the big deal? Like, these people still believe in Christ. They still believe that he died for their sins. Like, maybe they're adding stuff on, but what's the big deal? I guess we have talked about this to some degree, but why is Paul so upset? What's, what's, why has this made Paul so, you know, upset's the best word for it, I guess. What, what's so serious about this? Their souls are in danger, right? It's, it's, it, you know, he said there, like, it's a different gospel, but it's not really a different gospel. If you remember when Darrell talked about that, there's these words for different, and one's like similar. <laughs> I, I'm doing a terrible job of reiterating what, what Darrell said. Let's go back and listen to that class. But then the other word he uses is it's dif- different in a whole other category. It's, a, it's completely different. It's not even close to the same thing. And this other gospel, this new gospel, is, we've been kind of using the term gospel plus, is a, it's dangerous, right? Um, and so as we think about, you know, the reason Paul comes in with this tone, it's important to, for us to ask ourselves this question again and again, like, man, maybe Paul's taking this a little too, you know, being a little heavy handed here, but he's not just worried because he's not just upset with them. He's upset that this is happening. He's worried about these people that he's cared about so much that he spent time with, that he's, um, given a lot of himself to share the gospel with them. And so then he spends a lot of chapter one and two making a certain point. What, what point does Paul spend most of chapter one and two making? Do you remember? It was from God. Yeah, that his message was from God. That was a big part of it. And how... It wasn't about pleasing men. You know, it was about his message was from God and he wanted to encourage them in that. Yeah. Yeah, so his message wasn't from, wasn't about pleasing men, but that it was actually from God and for them, right? Yeah, he spent a lot of time talking about that. What other point did he make in these first two chapters? Gene? He's basically still on the thing about the law. He says, I can't believe that you have gone away from me and salvation. Yeah, so he, he does talk a lot about how they're, they're throwing away the teaching he shared with them and adopting an old teaching. And to some of them it's new because some of them are Gentiles, but it's, it's a teaching that isn't going to be, it's a, a pursuit that's not going to line them up with, with the gospel, with Christ himself. And one of the things Paul does in these first two chapters as he's trying to make this message clear is he, he defends himself right, right, as a teacher. Like, he defends himself. Like, who, who he is and what he's about. Like, and this gets even... The point that's already said, but he, he makes his point about this is who I am. This is how I receive the message that I'm sharing with you. And it's important that you understand that this message isn't from anybody else, that it's not from men, it's not from, it's not from any person, but it is from God himself. That this is the real thing. This isn't an imitation. This isn't my take on it. This is it. And so he's, he's really, in these first few chapters, he's making this point. He, he comes in strong. He says, I can't believe this is happening. And then he, then he spends the next few the sections talking about why they should listen to him. And to, what, really not to stop, but why they shouldn't disregard what he said, which is what they were doing. They've been disregarding everything Paul shared, to your point, Gene. They've been throwing away the gospel and listening to this new, this new kind of gospel. It's not really the gospel at all. 
And so part of the things that comes up here, and I already asked this question away, but I think this question is a little more directed now, a little, a little more pointed. What kind of significance does this add to, the, to what we listen to, to the people we listen to or the, the, the things we hear, the things that we, uh, you know, follow after? I'm not, this is a tough question because I'm not trying to say that we should shelter ourselves or we should never look around. But as we think about this, like Paul's talking a lot about false teaching in Galatians. He's talking a lot about the souls of these people and he's really worried about the, the condition they're in, the state they're in. And these people have come in who have warped the gospel and have led these Galatians astray. And so the question of, you know, I know the first question I asked is why is this so significant? What's the big deal? But the more pointed question for each of us is why, what matters about how, how significant or how important is it what we believe or what we think or how we, you know, interpret these things about, you know, the gospel? What, even if it seems similar, like what's, what's, the, what's the significance of these details that might seem inconsequential to some but are consequential? Why is it such a big deal to believe or to think about these things correctly. One thing, one thing that we can maybe learn, I'm just turning on the television and listening to all the talk you hear, is that almost anything can be made to sound good to us. So we need to know where it originates. What is the actual authority uh, and source of the truth that we believe? No, that's, that's, that's a great answer. Yeah, so the, Carrie said that, you know, you, you can turn on anything. You can look at the TV. There's so many people trying to sell so many things, basically, and, and get us to believe something, get us to buy something, get us to think something, because it'll benefit them. And we're easily fooled. People are easily fooled. I mean, you just turn on the TV late at night and watch infomercials, right? Like, how many people are buying these things because they see someone accidentally, you know, like... They can't cut an onion. And like, oh, well, I need that because that guy couldn't cut that onion in this video. You know, it's like, it's like we are so easily convinced and duped into things. And so Paul's point in, this, in the letter to the Galatians is, a lot of it is, you know, you got to know where the source is. You got to know where this information's coming from. And you got to know why you believe what you believe or where, you know, what, where it's leading you to as well. Anything else, Steve? I think that you have a great woman in the discussion of salvation Yeah, so in this, he, the, the specific false teaching that was going on with the Galatians was this, this kind of going back to relying on the law and their ability to follow it. And like you said, that the law was never intended to justify anybody. It was only, its purpose was to, like it's, it's said in chapter three and four, to shut us up under sin, to show us that we couldn't be righteous and then therefore to lead us to hoping in Christ, this Messiah. Uh, but you're right that they, you know, they, these Judaizing teachers were bringing in this teaching about having to follow the law, circumcision being like the, the pinnacle of that in their minds, and trying to lead these people astray, and leading these people astray with that. But here's, here's what I want us to think about. You think about these, these teachings, like, it's not just that they're wrong in their own, which they are, 
but it's about also where they lead you, right? And that's one of the things I wanted to think about. You know, this is something that, that, would, that God's dealt with throughout the history of dealing with his people. One of the verses that I thought about when I was thinking about this was in Jeremiah chapter 2. Um, I mean, you look to the prophets, and the prophets constantly were dealing with God's people being led astray by people who were twisting what God said, twisting the oracles of God, twisting what was significant to God for his people. And idolatry was a large part of that often in the Old Testament. And in, in Jeremiah chapter 2, he's, he's calling his people, he's talking about, you know, my Bible has a heading that says, Judah's apostasy. It's, he's talking, he's looking at these people who are, have fallen away from him. And he, in the first three, few verses, you can see he talks about the relationship he had with them at one time. But then in verse 4, he says, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What injustice did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and walked after emptiness and became empty? And there's a lot of things to be said about this section. I, there's, bringing it up is, opens a can of worms in some, in some senses for me. But the one thing I want to look at is what, what did they become like? These people, as they pursued idolatry, what did they become like? He says they pursued what? Emptiness. And what did they become? Empty. And this is what I was trying to get to with the first question I asked. Even this question about you know, how we, what, what we believe and why we believe it. What, what's significant about it? It's really significant that these teachings, they lead a person to become a certain kind of thing. Where our mind, go, where our mind starts, our, our, like our whole being follows. And these Christians were being led to believe that they had to do what? To be, to be pleasing to God. They had to follow God's old law more closely. They had to be circumcised. They had to follow these feast days and these, you know, these other things from the old law, whatever was you know, under that umbrella into the Jewish person's mind. They had to follow all these things. They had to do it well. They had to be good at following the law again. And the question is, two questions come to my mind. First of all, why is that something we want to believe? Because people were tricked by this, so to some degree they wanted to believe it, right? Why do you think people wanted to believe that? Gene? The whole, the whole thing that I see it is that we tend to want to believe and think. Yeah. Because I can touch this, I can feel that, I can see this. I cannot see God, I can't see mm -hmm. Jesus Christ. And so they're always in the old law, which was telling them these are things that are uh, symbols of things, the real things that come to pass that we're told in Hebrews. So that's the problem. You start pursuing things, you're going to, it doesn't matter which things you pursue, idols, the old law, you're going to end up lost because there is no salvation there. Yeah. Yeah, so Gene said that it's one of the reasons we like, we, we like things, things we can see, things that are tangible to us. And the law made a lot of things tangible. I mean, there were shadows of things to come. They weren't, they were images of what God was actually trying to get us to understand. But you know, there's a part of us that likes to know, like, this is something I can hold on to. I, I did this or I didn't do this. You know, I, I forego doing that, but I did do this. And look how, you know, this is something I can, I can measure. It's quantifiable to us. Is that what you're, you're yeah. And I, I think that's a big part of it, is that there is like this very realistic element to it that is maybe tantalizing. What else? Why else might people be tempted to be believe in this gospel plus that the Judaizing teachers were, were shilling to them? What's tempting about that? Why, why might we want to believe that? Darrell? Yeah. Darrell said, introspection is difficult, being, you know, honest with yourself is difficult, but checking off a list is easy. And I think that is a big part of it, is that the, the law offers, like trying to follow the law, it offers all these things. You know, you look at the Pharisees, they would tithe mint and cumin and all these things. But it's interesting is they didn't, they weren't, they weren't introspective enough to see they weren't following the heavier things, like honoring their parents and taking care of the people around them. That's good. Uh, Sterling, do you have your hand up? Yeah, that you're pointing out that we, we can be sheeple a lot of times, right? Sometimes we just want an authority to tell us. And the law had a lot of authority behind it. It had a lot of oomph. It had a lot of, hey, do this, don't do this, and here's what happens if you do this. And it's like, oh, okay, like, I'll avoid that. And so I think that a lot of it is, like, it's just, it, it helps us 
feel like we're doing something the right way. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's one of the main ones I was thinking of. And she, she said that, she pointed out that we like to believe that we can do enough good things to be pleasing. And this is a tricky, it's a slippery idea. Because to a certain extent, God wants us to do good things. Not to a certain extent. He does want us to be people who are very involved with doing the right things. Of course. But then we get it twisted and we think, well, if I do all the right things, then I'm going to be, God has to love me. You know, he has to look at me and see how awesome Ben is because look at all these things that I've done. And so a big, I think a big temptation with this gospel plus we've been looking at, we, we can look at these people and say, man, they were so foolish. Why would they want to go back to the old law? But it's like, man, like they are us. You know, they are just, we're just as prone to, to false teaching and to these false ideas that lead us to an empty place as these people were. And if we just look at this teaching and say, well, man, they shouldn't have believed that, then we're not going to get anything out of Galatians. It's just going to be a, a, you know, a historical book about these people who made a mistake that I'm never going to make. But we have to see that this kind of teaching, it may not be the same exact teaching, but a version of it is always going to be, might always be tempting to, to people who are trying to follow God. That there is always going to be a temptation to be like, well, hey, I can do all the right things. I can, tangi- I can make my, my relationship with God tangible. I can forego introspection and just check things off a list. I can do all these things and I can just follow this authority and everything's going to be good. But it's not. And just like this gospel plus that Paul was gravely concerned about, any false teaching that we might believe that follows in those footsteps will lead us in a place to where we're not actually following in the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's not where we want to be. And so this letter, you know, as you think about this, like we have to really be combing this for the principal significance, the principles that apply to us, because we are just as susceptible, just as liable um, to make the same mistake that they were making. Anything else about, about that, that thought? One of the interesting things about this, that, that does make this, I would imagine, made this hard, especially in this transition period for these Jewish and Gentile people, is that this was a system God had given his people to follow for so long. And his people hadn't done a very good job of following it, but it had been something that was from God. And so it had started to demand some discernment from those people, um, from his people, to, to know how to use the old law. And we still struggle with that, don't we? Struggling to know what to do with God, the Old Testament. Struggling to know what to do with God's commandments in, in Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I can kind of feel for these people not, not discerning that well. But this brings Paul to chapter 3, where, and Darrell did a great job of this, and it was a really insightful class for me on Wednesday night, where Paul goes into chapter 3, and he starts bringing up things we've heard in Romans. Um, you know, this is where he uses, look at Galatians 3, verse 1. He says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law, or, or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish Having begun with the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? This is the point. This is Paul's you know, being very straightforward. He's being, he's being straight up with them. Look, like you began with what? What began you in the gospel? Hearing with faith. You heard the word and you had faith to believe it. And now you think that you're going to be perfected by these works of the law? That, that God's spirit is what saved you and now your flesh is going to perfect the work that God started in you? I mean, Paul does, you know, as Paul does, he has this really <laughs> amazing turn of phrase to, to make this point. Look, you started this way, now you believe you're going to finish the work that God's spirit started? Are you really? I mean, he's, he's pointing at them. This is a little bit of an arrogant thing to believe, isn't it? That the work that you, God started in you by faith through his spirit, that you could be the one who finished it. And maybe that's a part of this too, is that we want to believe that we could be the ones to, to do it ourselves. 
But he goes into this, he starts going into this, uh, this distinction between the law and the covenant to Abraham. And this is one of the significant things that I wanted to, to talk about because it was a light bulb moment for me, so I wanted to spend some more time talking about it. On Wednesday night, do you guys remember what, what, was, the, what was the distinction? What was the discussion we were having about God, the covenant to Abraham versus the law of Moses? Do you remember some of the things that, that were pointed out there that Darrell pointed out on Wednesday night? He brought up all the parties involved, right? That this covenant was made, and there was a covenant made between God and Abraham, and it had to do with the seed who is Christ. And this is all, this is chapter 3, you know, starting in verse 15, he starts breaking down these differences, going very specific into to law and covenant. And then he, you know, that's, that's the covenant, is that it was between God and Abraham, and it wasn't to seeds, but it was to one. It was to the seed that is Christ. That's verse, chapter 3, verse 16. And then the law, verse 17, he says in chapter 3, verse 17, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. And he goes into discussion, well, what's the law about? And the law, he says, was ratified by angels that had mediators of different times. Moses was a mediator, and there was all the prophets who also mediated it. But what was the significance of the law? So the, the, the promise came in, it was given to Abraham, and it was... It was a promise of what would come through the Messiah, this promise of the seed. But the, the old law came, the law came, and like Steve already pointed out, what was its purpose? It was to shut us up under sin. It was to show us that we were hopeless people, that we couldn't do it on our own, that really there was no way to live up to the righteousness of God. And instead of making us hopeless, it was supposed to lead us back to what? The promise, right? Right? The promise that God gave through Abraham. And here's one of the things that I, uh, I was thinking about that I thought was really interesting about this, this idea. Is what, the Judaizing teachers, what did they say, what was the, the thing they used to make their point about, what was the, the evidence they used, the thing they used to make their point about the Jewish law as a whole? What was the one thing they reduced it down to? It was circumcision, right? But, and if you, look, if you look back to the Old Testament, do you remember when God instituted circumcision? This can get really uncomfortable really quick. Might talk about circumcision for a little bit. But when did God institute circumcision? Was it when the old law was instituted? He instituted with Abraham. You look at Genesis 17. And it was to, to when God came, you know, shortly after that, God comes and talks to Abraham face to face. It's, this, it's all in, within Abraham's faith and with this direct contact with God, with this promise that Abraham believed and God reckoned it to him as faith. Well, believing, as, yeah. Was righteousness. And so circumcision wasn't a sign, if you look at this distinction Paul makes between the covenant and the law, circumcision wasn't a sign of the law, but what was it a sign of? It was a sign of the, the promise made to Abraham. And so I'm going to get a little awkward with you because this is something that came to me, and I, just, I, I want to share it because I think it's important, but I also think we don't like to talk about these things, so just bear with me, and we're all adults here, so I I'm, I'm feel okay sharing this. But circumcision is a sign of this promise coming through the seed. And that's something I didn't understand for a long time until really Wednesday night in some senses. That it was, that is as simple as it is. But these Judaizing teachers were using circumcision as what? They made it a work. They made it into something that that proved that they could follow the law, that they did what they were supposed to. It was another thing they kind of checked off the list. And they made it this work of the law. But the law's significance was never hope. The law was never about giving people hope. The law was about showing us really how inadequate we were, that God was proving something to us that we could see in our own actions, that I could never do enough, that I could never be enough to really live up to the righteousness of God. But thank goodness that he made a promise to me that one day there was going to be a hope that comes through this seed. And that's what circumcision is a sign of. The circumcision is a sign of this promise that God made that he would one day bring a seed, a person, Messiah, who would save us from our sins. And so circumcision was always about what? It was always about looking forward to the day that Jesus Christ would come into this world and save us from the hopeless condition we found ourselves in. 
And that's, here, again, getting, this, getting back to Galatians and this, this idea, the Judaizing teachers reducing the law and reducing this gospel plus down to being to circumcision and how that is about following the old law, they totally missed the point. I mean, in many ways, but one of the ways they missed the point is that circumcision wasn't even a sign of the law, it was a sign of the covenant. And so these Jewish teachers, these Judaizing teachers were not just twisting the gospel, but they were also even twist, twisting the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the Old Law. And they didn't understand any of it well. And here's what's significant about that. Is that God had provided, even in the Old Testament, even in the, under the Old Covenant, God had provided a hope for people when they realized, when we realized, I guess it's they, when they realized that they couldn't live up to God's standards for them. And sometimes we don't realize that. We don't believe that. We don't see that in the Old Testament. That God was just vindictive and angry. He wanted you to do all the right things. But it wasn't the case. The old law was about faith. That's why David was pleasing. That's why these people who were pleasing to God, they, they looked to God in faith even when their actions didn't live up to it. And so this is the interesting thing when we look and you, know, you think about this, this distinction of what circumcision was supposed to mean versus what these Judaizing teachers were, were kind of contorting it to mean if they really understood what they were talking about, they would have realized that this circumcision was leading them to Jesus Christ himself. And that's part of the point that I think Paul makes in, in Galatians 3. One of the things I think, one of the points that this comes up then, I think is in Colossians chapter 2, where Paul makes very similar points to what he's saying here in Galatians 3 and 4. Um, and he's talking about, against false teachers in Colossians 2. And if you look at Colossians 2, starting in verse 8, Paul says in Colossians 2 verse 8, he says, well, you look at verse 6. He's saying very similar things. Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. But look at verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world rather than according to Christ. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority, and in him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and the removal of the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through, the faith, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So what is Paul's point that, what's kind of the new circumcision in the New Testament? I mean, maybe it's not a perfect, but it, Paul does draw a connection between two things, right? What does Paul connect in the gospel to circumcision? Jason? Baptism, baptism right? He, he's connecting this idea that baptism is similar. And this is, I think, a really significant point because, and Darrell even talked about this Wednesday night, that what baptism is about, it's about faith in God. It's not about doing something so I can be saved. It's about the fact that I believe in something, in, in Jesus Christ, and that he died for me, and so I'm baptizing myself into that death. But here's something what clicked for me on Wednesday. That's what I wanted to share. In the old law, in the old, under the old law, they had this hope that they were looking forward to through their descendants, through the seed promise that God gave and through circumcision. And it was Jesus Christ. And now we, in the same way, have baptism, which is what? It's us being buried with Jesus Christ. It's a reminder of that death that he died. And maybe this is obvious to all of you, but it's something I wanted to share because it, it, this is what, you know, Galatians and Colossians, a lot of it's has this undercurrent of this idea that it's all drawing us back to just faith in Christ. And these actions that we take, whether it's being baptized in the new law or being circumcised in the old law, it wasn't about just doing that, but it's about the significance that was implied by you making that commitment. I mean, circumcision, definitely a commitment, but baptism is also a commitment. That we believe that one day... For us, it's one day in the past. For them, it was one day in the future that God was going to save and God did save the whole world through this person he brought into the world, Jesus Christ, and through his death on the cross. Now, I'm, I'm preaching the obvious Christian truths, but here's the thing. These were things that had started to get contorted by these teachers, they added to that and said, all right, yeah, we're saved by that, but now we also have to do X, Y, and Z. If you, really, if you really want to be pleasing to God, you have to also be this way and do this thing and, you know, follow it the way I follow it. And they added all these things, these addendums and these amendments onto the gospel itself.
And that leads us into what's going to be the second half of, of Galatians, where we have these sections about the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit, and the idea of loving each other and bearing each other's burdens, and what our freedom in Christ is really about in chapter 5, verse 1. And I'm really looking forward to those discussions, and I'm trying not to uh, trample on them too much right now. But all this leads us, I think, to one of the questions, and it's like, it's, it's nebulously in my head right now, this question, but this leads us to the question in Galatians, like, these people were buying into this false teaching that was kind of all about, it was arrogantly about our own actions, about me being able to make the gospel, make my relationship with God tangible. So the question becomes, well, what is a relationship with God really about? Right? I mean, that's, the, that's a necessary question. If it's not about making things tangible, if I can't do these things, check these things off the list, if I can't just follow an authority or not be, avoid introspection, like what, what is following the gospel in faith? What does it mean to interact with God through faith? And I know this is an obvious question, but it, it, and it's a simple question, but it's a question that we don't, I think, maybe myself, answer enough with real answers. Because this was their answer. These Judaizing teachers gave people an answer to this question. What does it mean to follow God in faith? Well, it means to follow the old law. And sometimes we just believe easy answers. Well, what does it mean to follow God in faith? Well, it means I go to church. It means I take the Lord's Supper. I contribute. I sing. I worship. You know, I do all these acts of worship. And therefore, I'm following God. I have faith. So I want us to think about, like, what does this mean? What is it, the principal question that they were dealing with, different iteration than we might, but what's the principal, how do we answer that principal question? What does it mean to follow God in faith? In context of all these false teachings, especially. What does it look like? Sterling? I think that's like, One of the things I think of is in its covenant loyalty. Yeah. My allegiance is to God in and above any other allegiance, relationship, or anything else I have, and that will dictate all other relationships, allegiances that I have. So my whole life lives under the banner of this is my king, regardless of who's president, governor, who's my teacher, who's what's going on at work. This is the fundamental thing. And regardless of what people think of the king. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Yeah, Sterling made the point that this, it all comes down to covenant loyalty. And loyalty is a great synonym for faith. You know, this all comes down to covenant loyalty that I, you know, I'm, I'm right there. Wherever Jesus is, wherever our king is, wherever he calls me to be, that's where I am. And I, regardless of anything else, regardless of whatever's going on in this world, regardless of whatever people think of Jesus and the gospel, that I, I'm loyal to him. And I'm loyal to his cause, and I'm, I'm able to then speak up about it, even, as a, as a, maybe a, a byproduct. Josh? If you ask, uh, you know, what does it look like? I think that's where the confusion is, because it probably doesn't look that different. Mm-hmm. If there's an outside perspective looking at it, it may not look that different, but the motivation behind it, behind covenant loyalty versus behind law-keeping for uh, the purpose of justifying my own actions uh, is, is where the, the, the fault lies. Yeah. From the outside perspective, it may not seem that different, but the motivation is entirely different. Yeah, Josh made the point that, it, you, honing in the fact that I said, what does it look like? Because this is the question we have, right? What does it look like to follow God? And that's where we kind of, you said, maybe get led astray, is that we're looking for it to look different. But it's all about motivation. I mean, this is, again, like, I'm making these obvious points, but it's because they're things that we, we know, but we don't maybe think about the significance of them. Um, when Paul looks back and talking about David, what does he say he was? He was a man after God's own heart. Like, we look at David, and he was impressive to us because his heart was attuned to being loyal to God. You know, I think after, I think the punishment that he got for his sin with Bathsheba, where the, the, not his punishment, but the, the results, the consequences of his son dying. And David's response to that is always puzzling, isn't it? To a certain degree that he prayed and he prayed and he prayed while the son was still living that God wouldn't take his life. And then God takes the life of his son. And what does David do? First thing, he gets up, cleans himself up, and he goes and he worships God. It's like, well, what in the world? God gave you a big resounding no to everything you wanted, David, and you're going to worship him after that? But it's to your point that it, that's how, in moments like that you can, is where you can actually see it, Right? Maybe it can become a little more tangible in those moments where 
nothing is working out for you physically, nothing is working out for your life, but you understand that God's still there and that you're going to be loyal to him even when he doesn't act in accordance with what you might want in the moment. Um, But you're right, it does get back to our motivations and our heart. But it might look very similar to other people who are doing it for the wrong purposes. That's That's a tough thing. Darrell? was that this system was being imposed on them by other people. <clears throat> and he'll go on to say, as we continue in the book, that the, one of the great advantages, or perhaps the great advantage of what he's teaching here is that it frees us from the constructs of men. Yeah. Yeah. So, Darrell said one of the things that the Galatians were struggling through is that they were having a system imposed on them. But the true, one of the benefits of the true gospel that Paul's going to talk about is that it's, it's about freedom. It frees us from all these constructs of men. It frees us from all these systems that men impose, and it gets us back to what God says. And this is back to Carrie's point, back to Paul's point. Why, why it's so important that Paul receive this message from God and not from men. It's because they were dealing with a construct of people, of fallible men. And Paul was trying to share with them the gospel as God sees it. Not just as God sees it, but as the gospel as God, as God would share it. And so here, you know, this question of what does it mean to follow God in faith is, is the question of having a relationship with God, right? Um, but I think Josh's answer is, is really important to think about, that it might look the same, but even gets back to one of the things Terrell said, that it takes a lot of introspection, a lot of motivation check of why am I doing the things that I do? Why do I go to church on Sunday? Why does God tell me to come to church today? There's a lot of, there's a few reasons. One of them is to encourage each other, right? Do you ever come to church and then on the way to church think, well, what am I going to do for the people out there? Do you ever think about that? That's the reason why God, one of the reasons God encourages us to come here. But do we ever think about that on the way here? Thinking, well, hey, what am I supposed to be here for? Is there someone here that I could encourage? Who can I talk to? Do I know someone who's going through something? What can I do for them? That's the heart of that commandment to a certain degree. But sometimes we just think, well, I just need to be there because I need it. And that's true. We need it too. But there's, this is the question that gets to a lot of these things where we do these things because we know we should, but we don't always know the heart of them or, or see to the heart of them in our own lives. Steve, you were going to say something. I think as far as what it looks like, if we can look upon Christ not only as our prophet, priest, and king, but our example, and read through the Gospels, and of course we have to detract all the miracles he performed, but in his life, the loving, the caring, the serving, the compassion, the way he treated people, the way he led his life, I would think if he can draw a picture of what that would be, life as a Christian would look an awful lot like that. Yeah, that's perfectly put. I mean, and that's where Galatians is going to go. Galatians 5, where it talks about the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit, that's exactly his point. Is that the fruit, what are the fruit of the Spirit? Yeah, they're characteristics, right? They're character traits. And that's one of the interesting things about the word Spirit is that the word Spirit sometimes can be translated as character. And the fruits of God's character in our lives, what are they? Are they works like like the flesh? No. The fruit of God's spirit in our lives is that we are changed people. And this, if, if you listen to Jared's sermon or if you're going to in a second, that's what he's talking about to a certain degree is that knowing Jesus changes us and having God's spirit has to change us. And so Steve's point is part of like, he, he pointed to Jesus Christ as he lived and, and breathed on the earth that our lives, what it looks like to follow God in faith would look an awful lot like what Jesus did, how we talk to people. And sometimes we might need to read the gospel with that lens. Instead of just being impressed by Jesus saying, read the gospel with, well, how did he interact with this kind of person? How did he interact with this demoniac? How did he interact with the Pharisees? I mean, Jesus spent an awful lot of time in Pharisees' houses. That's interesting, right? Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about the fact that that was his character? I'm off on a tangent. But this is what following God in faith, it's, it's about character. It's about heart. It's about the fact that our spirits, as we're, we're, as we're interacting with God, we're trying to, on our part, do our side of the effort to line up our spirit with God's spirit. 
But a big part of this is that in faith, even that can be mis- misguided because we have to realize first and foremost in faith that God's the one who's doing the work through us. And that becomes a really difficult thing to untangle for us sometimes. I think that's part of the issue here is that we wrestle with, well, what is God's part? What's my part? And I'm just talking both sides right now. Um, maybe not helpful. But this is what I think is the, is the difficulty. Lawrence? The human tendency is to look at the sign, through the sign, and see the thing that it signifies. The Jews didn't see that circumcision was looking to the sea. And we sometimes look at baptism and argue about all the different surface aspects of it, but we don't see Christ as the focal point of baptism, the Lord's Supper or any other commandments that God gives us. But Jesus was always about seeing the why behind the what, And that's transformative, and it puts us in a whole different place than just growth of humans. Yeah, that's so good. That's probably way to end this discussion. Lawrence is saying that, if you didn't hear it, I can't really summarize all of it, but... Um, just ask him to repeat himself, and he'll get it for you. Uh, but just seeing the why behind the what, seeing the significance of the things we're doing is what Jesus always did. He didn't just see that we had to do these certain things, but he saw that there was a significance and a heart behind them. That's a Sermon on the Mount. You know, don't just, you can't just not murder. You also have to not hate. You can't just not commit adultery. You also have to not lust. There's a heart behind all these things that is more significant than the action themselves to a certain degree. Not that the action isn't important. Um, but yeah, that's a great point. I really appreciate all your participation. I hope this was helpful today. I love all of you, and we'll continue on through Galatians and Wednesday night.